Join me as I explore the exciting world of model railways with behind the scenes features, step by step tutorials, interviews, videos, reviews, and much, much more. I'm Dawn Quest and I love building model railways. Tunbridge Model Rail Show held every year in Tunbridge, a town the British often confuse with its neighbouring town of Tunbridge Wells. For our American viewers, it's like confusing those other two towns up the road from each other with very similar sounding names, Milwaukee and Cincinnati. Tunbridge has a castle, a river, a cat cafe, and of course, the UK's oldest wimpy opened in 1964. The Model Rail Show is held at the Angle Centre, which shares its car park with Sainsbury's and is the only car park in Europe to adopt the New York grid pattern system and has won Car Park of the Year seven times. This year will be Tunbridge Model Railway Club's 41st exhibition since the club was formed in 1867 a whole nine years before Stevenson's rocket made its maiden voyage. However, most people know Tunbridge as the birthplace of Dave Ballinger, the drummer from the band The Baron Knights. You can find out much more about this local celebrity by stopping off at the Dave Ballinger Visitor Centre on the High Street. A road has been named after him on a new housing estate with a range of two bedroom houses built by local builder Dame Kelly Holmes. Tunbridge is also known uh, for... Uh, you and I what? need to have a word. What about? Well, these intros. Yeah, they're good. Everyone likes them. No, no, this is a model railway channel. It's not a travelogue. Yeah, but I like doing it. Oh, really? Yeah. But our viewers don't. They do. I've been looking at the stats and they've been dropping off like flies during your intros. What, over to you then, Dawn? Can I? All right. Thanks. It's the Tunbridge Model Railway Show and here we are in the Dave Ballinger Suite as befitting the lowly status of the beleaguered drama. It's the smaller of the two halls here at the Angel Centre. Angle Centre. No, I think you'll find it's the Angel Centre. Anyway, let's get started. The queues are forming. More on that later. The doors have only been open a few minutes and already the exhibits are attracting quite a crowd including me and Grumpy. One thing my good old nan taught me is that a charming smile and sharp elbows win the day, as does knowing the way to the upstairs gallery, with an overview of this, the main Baron Knight Sports Hall. I have to say, when you're expecting crowds as big as today's, floor space is everything, and the Tunbridge Model Railway Club have done an excellent job with wide aisles and a nice easy flow through of traffic from this hall to next door's David Ballinger suite leading on to the Pete Longford room. So let's not waste any time, let's get on to the layouts. Are you sure about this Baron Knight's Tunbridge connection? I mean, I've never heard of it. Yeah, I've Googled it. <sighs> really? Once we did fight our way through the crowds, we encountered another problem. For the first 15 minutes or so, very little was moving. And as this is a model railway channel and not a channel about static caravans, this posed something of a problem. But then, as if by magic, it was full steam ahead. So, let's go to the layouts again. And I thought I'd start with one of the most stunning layouts of the show. This is Boson's Wharf owned by Bob Stevens and Ian Corr from the Southampton Model Railway Club. Ian tells me that the layout started with four 12-foot boards and it has grown and grown, so much so it no longer fits in his garage. Boson's Wharf is a double-O gauge layout based on the principle of everywhere and nowhere. It represents any great port around Britain, Europe or the world for that matter, away from the hustle and bustle of the main port with its large liners and cargo ships. But there's still a lot going on. Small wharfs and quays are the home of the humble coaster and ships on the home trade. It's in these that Boson's Wharf has been set. Notice anything special about this picture? 
Ian and Bob have incorporated a mirror into the backboard, giving this incredible illusion, making it seem that the layout is so much bigger than it actually is. There's so much going on in this layout, it's easy to see why this was an absolute crowd pleaser. From Bosun's Wharf to Horsebridge Wharf. Wolf, wolf. Oh, really? Horsebridge Wharf is an EM gauge layout from the Basingstoke and North Hans Model Railway Society. I was told at the Erith show that EM gauge is the future, apparently. The layout recreates a fictitious location at the end of a branch line from Plymouth to Callington. This line was part of the Plymouth, Devonport and South Western Junction Railway. After passing Calstock Station, the line follows a route along the Tamar River arriving at Horsebridge. The era of this layout is the 1930s. From one specialist gauge to another, the HO Finescale Obakea. Owner Geraint Hughes says Obakea is unashamedly experimental. After many years modelling a British subject in P4, he says he wanted a new challenge and found it in P87 scale with a Danish prototype. Why Danish? Well, Geraint says his hometown is twinned with Reba, Denmark's oldest town where the old houses cry out to be modelled. There's something decidedly Scandinavian in the air as we travel from Denmark to Norway, or excuse me, Noriga. Noriga is an HO layout created by Mike Carter. It's a fictitious seaport with a busy local fishing industry. Mike says the layout is best described as all the right notes, but not necessarily in the right order. So let's hear from Mike himself. Basically started when we went on our cruise to Norway and we went on the historic Flam Railway, which uh, climbs up on a, a very steep gradient of one in 18. Um, we had a lovely trip and uh, very, very cleverly, the uh, tourist office was selling models of the train. So, unfortunately, I came away with an entry. Um, on various other trips to Norway, I picked up a few coaches, and then we ended up with all this stock here. So we had to make a layout. It happens to us all, Mike. Uh, building kits for Norway are in very short supply. So a lot of the buildings are actually scratch built. So the, the building behind me here is part of the Brigham, which is in Bergen. And this was scratch built out of wood, taken from a holiday photograph. Similarly, the lighthouse here is the Kunigar Lighthouse, which is just outside the fjord that comes into uh, Trondheim. So this once again was scratch built. The little houses here are typical Norwegian houses, which were the house kits that they prepared after the Second World War. Because the uh, houses were demolished by the German troops, um, there was no housing. So you could buy a kit from the government and make your own little house. So these are scratch built based on those designs. The, the fun thing is the station here, which is actually named Hell. It means something else in Norwegian, but you understand the joke. And then, of course, the typical thing with Norway, if you ever go there, you'll find a reindeer traffic jam. So there, we're depicted there with the reindeer. You just have to wait patiently while they walk away. Everything about Noriga is absolutely gorgeous, but I especially love this little cyclist powered by a Magnarail system. Magnarail kits are available for around £130 and can be used to power things like cars, boats and of course cycles. I'll just leave you to enjoy this for a few minutes more. The exhibition is really filling up now, but a little bird has told me there are still queues down the block. Let's go and have a look. It's half past 10 and they're still queuing. Queuing, 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 queuing. Well, when they finally do get inside, a whole treasure trove of exhibits and trade stands awaits, including this one, Gosfield Yard. Gosfield Yard is an O-gauge layout from the Braintree and Halstead MRC. 
It's set in the eastern counties, and although the village of Gosfield exists, it was never railway served. The name was chosen to reflect the club's location at the time, so this gives a certain amount of dramatic license when it comes to this layout. Gosfield Yard is designed to be able to depict different eras from the time of the Big Four, up to the late 60s and the end of steam. The main focus of the layout is of course the large goods shed and yard. This layout was especially popular with young children. They were able to get their hands on a controller and have a go. This is Robin and he's here with his mum. I promised I'd say hi, so hi Robin. From big slow trains to small fast trains and Ospringe, St Peter and Water Lane, this is an engage from the Faversham Model Railway Club and what a busy layout this is. Ospringe St Peter is situated somewhere towards the eastern end of the North Kent line, fairly close to Bisingwood Junction. The station takes its name from the parish church as there was a plan to build the second station up the line. Sadly, this didn't come to fruition. Ospringe itself has developed quite remarkably since the Industrial Revolution and evidence can still be seen of a former era in the form of the Guildhall, situated towards the right of the display. This busy market town has grown and prospered over the years and now thrives as can be seen by the bustling High Street and the bus station which brings shoppers in from the surrounding villages. The eagle-eyed observer will notice the single track branch which descends the hill to a terminus station, Water Lane. Water Lane is also the home of a motive power depot incorporating engine sheds, ash pits and a turntable. Another engage layout now, this is Kinloch Luggan by Michael and Marie. And Michael tells me there actually is a town called Kinloch Luggan, but she spell it with an A, not an E. Little fact for you there. Michael also challenged me to find some foxes, a badger, a dog in a kennel, some squirrels, a cat, but being as it is engaged, they were all so tiny, I gave up. Kinloch Luggan has a passing loop and limited freight facilities. Trains frequently pass here and the layout can be operated in the steam green diesel era, the BR blue era, Scott rail era or as a preserved line. It may have a long tongue twister of a name, but Kinloch Lagen is very easy to erect and take down and can be transported in the back of an estate car. Time for a queue check. It's now 11 o'clock and they're still queuing. Queuing, queuing, queuing. While the people of Tunbridge and surrounding areas seem to enjoy queuing, this was the Angel Centre last week when they announced extra tickets for a Baron Knights tribute band. Are you sure about this Baron Knights connection? I mean, I've never heard of it. I've Googled it. Are you sure though, yeah? Yeah. All that time wasted standing outside in queues could be better spent standing inside in a queue. So the Tunbridge show is a massively popular show, incredibly busy. As you can see, speaking to the show organisers, they expect by the end of today to have seen around 1,600 people walk through these halls, having a look at all the exhibits on offer. One thing you get with lots of people is, of course, queues out the door. And what show doesn't want queues out the door to prove just how popular it is? However, what you don't want is long queues lasting 15 minutes, 20 minutes. I've been speaking to some of the people who were in the queues earlier today and they said they were waiting for around 25 minutes, 30 minutes or so. This isn't a new thing. This has happened time and again with the Tunbridge show. Every year there seem to be queues, long queues that last over half an hour. Now that's all very well for adults, but what if you have a young family with small children? You don't really want them to queue for longer than necessary, especially if the weather isn't that great. One way to get families through the door to attract them to your model railway exhibition is to make that entrance process just a little bit more streamlined, a little bit easier. The queuing issue in the past is because the Tunbridge show has only accepted cash on the door. This year they're doing things a little bit differently. They're using a card reader. I was talking to the show organizers earlier and I did ask them, would they consider doing pre-sales ahead of the event through an external website? That's something they are going to be considering apparently. So next year, watch this space. Back to 2024 though, and some more spaces of the model railway variety. 
And what do you call a bunch of 009 layouts? Comments below. Well, here are a few of them. Starting with Wickhamborough Road by David Marshall. This layout depicts Wickhamborough Road on the Canterbury Light Railway in the late summer of 1938, just prior to the start of the war. There's something very lovely and bucolic about this layout. The station is over a mile from the village of Wickhamborough and it lives just between Canterbury and Wingham Town, sitting west of the junction to Wickhamborough Colliery. David has really captured the essence of the era with the colours and scenery, with Wickhamborough at the heart of the Kent orchards with fruit and hop growers providing additional seasonal goods traffic for the railway. By the end of the war, the railway was very run down and poorly maintained. It remained in private ownership until it eventually closed in 1951. Next up is Blackmore by Ian Lampkin. Blackmore Station was one of the main intermediate stations on the Linton to Barnstable Narrow Gauge Railway that closed in 1935. This hotel lasted until 1970 when it burnt down and there's no trace of it left. The main station building survives though, although much extended as a pub and restaurant. The last of the 009 bunch is LLR from Andy Hopper. This is a very pretty little layout, but it also has an unusual angle with its own zoo. If you look over the houses, you'll see a row of lovely neat gardens in the back. From elephants in Kent to bears in Canada, and the aptly named Bear Creek, an engage layout by John Boot. Tell us about the layout, John. It depicts Western Canada, British Columbia, maybe a bit of Vancouver Island as well. It's basically the freight traffic that runs through. There's no passenger service anymore. So the station is now derelict or just falling into disrepair. There's a little military base at the top there with a grain elevator, which is a principal source of traffic in Canada. I was interested in model railways since I was five. My father got me into it because he used to make the kits and it just has never ended from there. I've added little details to keep um, patrons interest when the trains aren't there, such as the little bears trying to get into the army depot or the bear there that's pushing over the man in the toilet who's reading a newspaper and have quite a rude awakening. It's won a couple of best in shows over the years since I've been exhibiting. Locomotives are basically diesels from the 1970 to 2000 period. Basically, I run what I like within that time frame. Another engaged this one by David Hazelden, a Tunbridge Model Railway Club member. Porthloo is a fictional location somewhere in the West Country in the 1930s to 1940s with a main line, branch line and a goods yard. Do you ever give your model railway characters little voices? Oh, these bags are really heavy. Finally a train. Oh, only me then. Moving swiftly on. This charming layout is Priorsfield, a double O gauge layout by Steve Morris. As represented, Priorsfield is a fairly busy little station. There are several passenger trains a day and various goods services. The station pilot spends its time messing around the goods yard and occasionally pulls the coaches of longer trains off their engines to release them. If you look closely, you'll notice all the lovely attention to detail, including this smoke coming out of the chimney. Very clever. As you know, I'm a big fan of younger people getting involved in the hobby and so it was great to see this collaboration between the Uckfield College Railway Club and members of Uckfield Town Model Railway Club. The club has had a link with Uckfield College since 2008, supplying an experienced modeler, Keith Nock, to work with the students. College Holt has been on the exhibition circuit since October 2018. It's based on historic photographs of Whitehall Holt on the Calm Valley Line, but the students decided to add a passing loop for operational interest. You get some real characters at model railway shows and sometimes they're on the actual layouts themselves. It looks like Edie from Last of the Summer Wine has broken down. Hazel End is an O-gauge layout by Mark Hedgecock. 
Mark is a member of the Wimbledon Model Railway Club, which celebrated its 100th anniversary this year, making it the second oldest model railway club in the world. Hazel End is an early British Rail era North Eastern LNER region country branch terminus. It consists of a wayside station, sidings and a good shed. You know, I'm not really sure about this Baron Knights thing. Are you sure? Where did you get your info from? Dave down the pub. Or Dave down the pub? Yeah. So you, he thinks it's the Baron Knights in Tunbridge? Well, it could have been the Black Abbots. <sighs> or the Nolans. Well, the Nolans, they're Irish, aren't they? Don't know. Are they? And finally, Clearly End by Peter Jackson, or as he likes to call it, Clearly the End. This is a narrow gauge layout with models built to O scale running on double O gauge track. Hazel End, Clearly End, and it's the end of the show for me too. Leaving already? Well, yes, I am. But then I have actually seen the whole exhibition and there have been so many incredible layouts, too many fantastic layouts to count, actually, and been some incredible inspiration. I only live up the road, so I'm off home now to have a cup of tea and to pet the dog. If you like this video, please do like, share and subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of all my future videos.